Much time has passed since the last great war. The world has changed. But some legends still remain. And for a few brave, some might say foolhardy explorers, the tales of the lost ships of the Bermuda Triangle are too tantalizing to ignore. the folly of men to ignore its dangers, and the mysteries that lurk in the deepest, darkest depths of the world. humans welcome to my cockpit today actually for the next couple of months we're going to show you how we created our submarine sequence actually i should say sequences the story continues through the episode so don't go skipping to the end from building the mini sub cockpit pete's flight chair which is now our gaming chair <laughs> to building and shooting the subs themselves and capturing water elements in a fish tank to then be added in post to kick off, we're going to show you how we created our submarine shots using miniatures. Now there's a bunch of amazing films from Days Gone that have used what's called the dry for wet technique in order to put us right down there into the depths without having to go right down there into the depths. Films like Hunt for Red October, The Abyss, The Shape of Water, Inner Space. They all use this technique to shoot sequences that take place deep underwater. Or in Inner Space's case, deep inside Martin Short. <laughs> Now, I don't like caveats, but let's be clear, we're obviously not attempting to create work of that level here. We're just demonstrating these techniques to show you what you could achieve with limited means. Right, now, time to rewind to a year ago when we shot the first of our two submarines. So in this sequence that we've cooked up, our intrepid explorers are making their way down into the depths of the Pacific Ocean in search of wreckages from the fabled Bermuda Triangle. And they're doing so in a version of the Zhao Long submersible, which currently holds the title for the deepest man dive of 7,000 meters below sea level. The thought of which is enough to make me gag. And that's why we sent Pete. I'm trying to get comms back online. Can you hear me? Copy. Yeah, hey, copy check. Oh, that's great, man. Keep an eye out though, yeah? I'm getting some really weird readings. And here she is. So this is a 172 scale model of the Zhao Lung sub, which JP has not only lovingly painted and weathered, having put the kit together, but you've also run some fiber optics through this. Um, now, obviously that's great because it's gonna give us some headlights, sell that sense of scale by giving it some, some practical lighting. Um, but this is a model kit. There's, there's, I don't think there's a light switch on here. So how do we turn it on? <laughs> uh, well, we're really lucky because this particular model just has enough space, just about enough space to put in a, a battery, and some LEDs and then some fiber optic uh, leads to go to the front of the right. vessel to give us the headlights. Yeah. And you're right, we don't have an exterior switch, so... Because we don't want to touch it. As little as, as, <laughs> as we can. Because you'll notice, if I do that, <laughs> it's going to do that for about half an hour. Half an hour? About an hour. <laughs> about an hour. About an hour. So it's got a magnetic reed switch, which is a handy way to activate the lights uh, remotely. Uh, Without touching the model, I will demonstrate. So that's off. And the way this works is it uses a magnet to open and close the contacts on the 
Reeves switch. Amazing. Yeah. A magnetic switch so that you don't have to touch it. These are the things that are so, so necessary when you're dealing with a tiny model on tiny wires. Game begin. When you're shooting effects, it's essential to have accurate storyboards to work from, as every setup can take a lot of time to pull off. You've really got to pre-visualize your edit and be sure your shots are going to match and cut together, especially when you're cutting miniatures with live action. Our first shot is a low angle perspective as our mini sub descends from the surface. We've rigged the Xiao Long so we can suspend it in the air. We're using fine monofilament used for fishing lures. It's not very strong, but we're hoping it's fine enough that the camera won't pick it up. Using some of the details on the sub, we managed two points of contact. We did a test with a single one and it just took forever to settle. And we didn't really have any way to control its position. We could have used a green rod and key it out in post, but we wanted to try and get as much as we could in camera and avoid problems in post production, especially as we're mostly top and back lighting. As we want the sub to descend at a steady speed towards the camera, JP takes the proverbial hacksaw to his motion control slider and uses the motor and pulley wheel to create a simple motorized pulley system that will allow us to control the time and speed of descent without having to go near the suspended sub. The first two shots of our sequence are the sub descending from a relatively shallow depth. And so to provide a contrast between these shots and the murky depths we see later, we rig a projector into the ceiling and run an animated water surface effect from a laptop. So to create that look of being deep down in the ocean depths, you guessed it, lots of smoke. It's really important to wait until there are little to no air currents moving the smoke around before you shoot. The moment the audience sees a wafting layer of smoke, the game's up. What's also great about this effect is that we now get those wonderful volumetric light shafts from our sub's onboard lights. Depending on where it's spinning, yeah. that might clip the top of the uh, okay. wagon. Okay. Might just have to get lucky with that. I'm just gonna bring... Because we're blacked out and purely top lit, the bottom of the sub is in almost complete shadow. And when it reaches our closest point of focus, we want to see some of that lovely detail. That's the bedger. That's the edge. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Yeah, lush. We set our camera to 50 frames a second to steady any movement from the sub to sell that sense of scale and of the heavy gravity and slowness of deep water. We're going to be shooting these first two shots at 50 frames a second and so we create a double speed render of the animation. Otherwise the shimmering water effect would likely be too slow and be barely perceptible when we conform back to 25 frames. Because we don't have full control over our suspended miniature, we run through takes until we get the perfect angle. Or until... Uh-oh. Okay. Well, that was inevitable. A little rewiring and we're back in business. And we shoot till we get that perfect shot. Game over. Hey, humans. If you didn't know, we're running a Patreon to try and keep this channel alive. So if you want to see more of this kind of joy in your eyeballs... Get over there and give us some money. For the second shot, I really wanted to see the light from the surface fade and we see the sub descend into darkness. To achieve this, we set the projector on a stand and fired it across the sub's path so that it would eventually descend below the line of light and give that sense that it's delving deeper into the darkness. And all we see are those tiny little lights disappearing into the depths. So the next thing we need is a set. Now, if we just had a series of shots of our sub moving through murky water, there'd be no sense of geography. So that's why we've built these monoliths. If we're going to have our sub moving through the scene from point A to point B, it's going to be pretty disorientating for the audience if point A and point B look exactly the same. So we need some features in this barren landscape to kind of give us a sense of locale. We can also use these features to our dramatic advantage not only to provide a sense of scale for our mini-sub, but of the thing that's hunting it. Using stills from the set of Hunt for October as our inspiration, we've sculpted these rocky towers to serve as back and foreground topography for the sub to navigate. I've basically made these out of wood bases, which I've cut to roughly the similar sizes, and then just stuck polystyrene on top. Used a grab adhesive to, uh, to stick these down. I've let that dry. And then basically, I'm just gonna hack away at it with a bread knife. This is sort of slightly serrated. Ultimately, you have to take quite a lot out to remove any sense that it was once a square thing. Next stage is then what we've got here. I mean, it's obviously 
bit phallic, uh, but don't blame me, blame nature. That's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm going with here. I've sort of sculpted all of these little kind of rocky, you know, crags and things like that, and then wrapped around it with plaster. Don't worry about the base, we're gonna add stuff to that later. I've tried to avoid going for anything too specific in terms of its shape. So if we make it too unique and too distinctive, I can only use it once. Whereas if I make them all, you know, all lots of details, but all a little bit homogenous in their look, it means we can kind of use them for different shots and people won't necessarily notice it's the same one being reused. If you make anything too specific, you'll be able to point it out straight away and say, hold on, wasn't that rock in front of him? Now it's behind him. Do you know what I mean? Maybe I'll make one that's really specific that we'll only use once just because it's good to have a unique shape every now and again. For the paint job, I start with a black base coat and then just dust over the top with a dull gray. As our sub has reached the sea floor at this point, we want to change the lighting. I cut a few sheets of plus green gel for our top and backlight to give us a murky green hue to contrast the blues we had on the surface. So normally I would diffuse this because it's directional uh, and it's going to be pretty strong. But because we're stopping down so much, we're generally shooting at about f11 to get as much depth as we can to make the miniatures feel bigger. But also, our next couple of shots involve seeing the sub just coming down around our, our, our peaks, right? And then we want to see the submarine, the big submarine's shadow coming over it. So it needs to be a little bit directional. With our light set, we arrange the rocks to frame the sub as it descends. So what we've got here is a shot in two parts. The first part of the shot shows the sub coming down and this is where we first see it coming into the depths. As we tilt down and stop our tilt, we see the tops of our big towering rocks just poking out. And there will be a cut in between this and the second part of it, we see the big submarine shadow coming over the top. The whole point is to show how small this thing is in comparison to what's following it. So what we initially did is cut out a little bit of cardboard, submarine shape to float over it, but it just wasn't big enough to really kind of sell that there's something massive and it wasn't throwing enough shadow over all of our peaks. So I've set up a big flag on an arm that we can basically just kind of spin over the rocks. But what we'll do is we'll shoot our first shot first, we'll get the sub coming out, we'll lock it off, then we can cut, then we know that there's a cut happening in the edit between that one and the next one, which is of this shadow coming over. But what it means is we need to make sure that we're set up and it all works for our shadow to pass over. Right, more smoke. We run through takes till we get that perfect amount of subtle rotation, finishing with the sub looking straight at us. With a few patience exercises in between. Spinny spinny is good. The rocky rocky is not good. And more smoke, obviously. Despite not having motion control, we really wanted to get at least one shot where the sub is traversing the rocky terrain. So JP rigs the sub from a boom pole sat on top of a motorized turntable. Meanwhile, I rearrange our rocks and set up a dolly to try and give the shot some parallaxing movement. We frame one of the rocks in the extreme foreground to give us a nice reveal. Of all the shots, this one felt the most Thunderbirdsy, which is to say that it looks most like a miniature, partly because of the obvious circular trajectory and the means by which we're moving it is far from stable but I know that we're only going to use a second or two of this shot in the edit, so the hope is that it will be too short for that to really be noticeable. To be honest, it was like trying to corral an ambivalent bee at times, but we got there in the end. Okay, so we've got our shot of the sub moving through the canyons, and having shot listed uh, this sequence, which is a rare thing, we know that our next shot is a low angle on the sub as Pete investigates debris on the seabed. And this means we actually need to sort out some, some, some rocky surface, right? Uh, so JP, what have you got for us? <laughs> well, a uh, quick way we discussed would be to prefabricate some rock texture for the floor. So I made some plaster casts of some real rock slate from my garden. Mm -hmm. Delightful. And, uh, so these are plaster cast reliefs, if you like, from a rubber mold. So what we can do is we can put these on the ground and we can dress around them different size pieces and yep. different 
kind of cracked pieces that can give us a bit of flat terrain to offer up around the towers. And what's nice about this as well is that they're essentially like tiles. And so what we, if we need a big space, yeah. we can literally fabricate loads of them, stack them up, and we've got a big starting point to, to, to go from, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then obviously we might have seams and things like this happening. And so what, 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 what we've also got down here, we've got a mixture of stuff to kind of fill in those gaps, right? So we've got some cat litter. We've also got some sand. And then we've also got this stuff, which is called Fuller's Earth, which is incredibly fine. And so basically what we've got is a mixture of different densities and sizes. Tines and colors, yeah. Yeah, and colors that we can, so we, if we do do the tile thing, we can use this to go in between the cracks and fill those cracks, but also just to generally dust about and just really mix up that surface. Yeah. Uh, and make it finer if we need it or keep it chunky if that's what we're after. So we set up our miniature seabed set in a tabletop style, allowing us to shoot at a really low angle. Once we've framed up, we start dressing to camera. You can waste a lot of time making a set look great to the eye when all you really need is for it to look great in the frame. What's nice about this low angle is that a few foreground tiles create a whole seabed and you can't see beyond that, so we actually didn't need that many. It also means we can set some of our towers into deep background without worrying about the bases. And we're bringing back the old flag trick again because, well, you'll see. What is that? It looks man-made. Like an antenna or something. But from what? I mean, you would, wouldn't you? It's hard. We're film geeks. We're making this kind of stuff. How can we not reference everything we can think of whenever possible? Sorry. Stay tuned. Next big episode, we're going to show you how we built this cockpit. Then I'm going to show you how to make this gaming chair, which is basically my cockpit chair for squadrons now, yo. Ah! Then we're gonna show you how we shot the big sub in Studio One. Then we're gonna show you how we shot all of our little water elements using a fish tank. So much joy coming, y'all. So subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when the next one's dropping. Give us a like, give us a comment. Social media channels, we're there. Do you wanna be there? I don't know. Until next time, adios.